Good afternoon and welcome to Groves Academy, March 3rd, 2022, Admissions Information Session. I am Kim Ani. I'm the Transitions Advocate here at Groves Academy. I will also act as facilitator today in taking your questions and directing them to our panel of experts and what we consider experts here at Groves. I'd like to provide a few directions before we introduce ourselves, and then I'll repeat them as well after we do that, because there are people still filing in to our webinar. At the bottom of your screen, if you float your mouse down, there's a Q&A bubble. If you click on that, you can type in a question, and then I will address questions. And again, like I said, direct them to the correct person that is sitting on our panel today. And here comes some more people. Good. Got a few more coming in. So let's start with introductions. Like I said, I'm Kim Ani, Transitions Advocate here at Groves Academy. I've been here for 13 and a half years. I worked in our lower school as a keyboarding teacher for a while, worked up in the Learning Center, and now I'm the Transitions Advocate for Groves, going into my fourth school year of doing that. I'd like to introduce our panel. I'll start with our staff and then move to our students and parents. Let's start with Curtis. Curtis? Welcome, everybody. My name is Curtis Olofsson. Uh, Director of School Operations is my title. Uh, I've been at Groves for 15 years, which is quite a long time, kind of looking back on that and started off as a FIA teacher. And then here at Groves, you know, we wear lots of different hats. So that kind of evolved into, uh, you know, where I am today. Uh, but I've been a coach, helped doing program development with activities and extracurriculars, summer programming. Um, so happy to be here. and Thanks for joining. Thank you, Curtis, so much for your introduction. Next, let's meet Abby. Abby? Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. I'm Abby Kirschbaum, and I am the admissions coordinator. And in my role, I help guide families through the application process and through the student visit days. Thanks, Abby. Um, let's meet Erica. Hi, my name is Erica Sutton. I'm the director of admissions. Um, I oversee the whole admissions department, and I'm oftentimes the first person you speak with when you're engaging and thinking about um, applying to Groves. And I also, along with Abby, will guide you through the process all the way to um, visit day and decision. Um, so thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Erica. Next, let's meet some parents and students. Lisa? Hi, I'm Lisa Carlson. I'm Sydney's mom. Um, I'm a parent at Groves for the past four years. I have three daughters at Groves, and Sydney is one of them. Nice Thank to you. So much. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Yeah, Lisa is a, a very experienced parent. And um, next, let's meet your daughter, Sydney. Hi, I'm Sydney. I've been at Groves three years, and I'm in eighth grade. Thank you, Sydney. Next, we'll meet another parent who also is very experienced, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie Anderson, and um, I am a parent of Silas over here, who's a senior. He's been here uh, since seventh grade. Thank you. And Silas, go ahead. Hi, I'm Silas. Um, I'm a, a senior this year in the upper school. This is my sixth year at Groves. Um, it's been probably a really awesome journey at Groves. Thank you very much. It has been an awesome journey. I agree, watching you grow. I do want to point out uh, Silas and Julie are joining us someplace a little closer to the equator today. <laughs> so no envy there from any of us. <laughs> okay, I see a few more people have joined us. We have introduced our panel of parents, students, and admissions and other experts here at Groves Academy. We're here to answer your questions today. My name is Kim Ani. I'm the Transitions Advocate. How do you ask a question? You go down to the bottom of your screen, click on the Q&A bubble, and you can type in your question. And then we'll move through the questions throughout our time here today. Uh, once questions wrap up, we may stop at that point, but we do have a hard stop at one o'clock. We have students that need to get back to class um, and parents that would like to get back to work or vacationing in the case of Julie and Silas. So um, I will try to wrap things up as timely as possible. I'm gonna start with a first question uh, that we have here. Why is Groves different from other schools? I think what I'd like to do is start with our parents and then move to students. So Lisa, would you be able to start that out for us? Absolutely. So um, transitioning to Groves has been just a wonderful experience. I think the biggest difference that is the um, support 
that Sydney has received, um, the communication with the teachers has been absolutely fabulous. We receive frequent updates um, on how she's doing, on how her assignments are. Um, she receives individualized support, which was very different from the school she transitioned from. Um, and her confidence has just soared um, and her ability since she's transitioned to Grove. So we've seen just huge differences um, coming into this environment. It's fabulous. Thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing that. Sydney, your thoughts on why is Grove's different from other schools? The teachers really give you more one-on-one -on -one, like attention and support with homework. And they really take the time to like teach and explain and expand on what you're learning. Thank you. And um, we'll head to um, Julie and Silas. Julie, you wanna answer that question first and then we'll let Silas answer. Yeah, some, some things that come to mind as I think about how Groves is different than other schools is that they really help equip and train the kids on how to learn given their learning differences, which is huge um, for growing their confidence and equipping them to succeed for their futures. Um, and another way it's different, I'd say, is it's a bit, it's more individualized. And um, uh, they also work really hard at equipping the kids on how to advocate for themselves, given their learning differences. And each one of these kids are, are unique from the other. There's no two kids that are similar at Groves. And that's what's cool about it is how the teachers really get to know and personalize um, the learning experience for the individual student and then teaching them how to advocate and um, kind of set their environment so they can learn best. Thank you, Julie. Silas? Uh, yeah, one, one thing that comes to mind that's different from other schools is the class sizes. It's much, very, very much smaller where it's like, I think eight, you know, eight to six kids per class and it's um, just being able to have that one-on-one -on -one with the teacher and, you know, help uh, mm -hmm. getting more explanation on an assignment if you're stuck on one or, you know, just reaching out to say, hey, I'm on a project, you know, so. Thank you, Silas. Um, I have another question for our students. Uh, you were the ones that transitioned into Groves. So think back, you've been here for a while, um, to that first day and those first weeks or when your parents said, we're gonna send you to this school. Talk about that experience and what it's like for you as a student transitioning in. Sydney, can you start us out? Um, transitioning in, for me, it was very easy. It was very welcoming. Everyone was very nice and it was easy to make friends. And it just like the environment felt more welcoming, especially because the other kids around me, they also have maybe dyslexia or things. So we have that in common and things like that. Thank you, Sydney. Um, Silas, uh, you've been here a while. Can you think back to when you first started and what it was like to um, come into Groves from another school? Yeah, um, for me, it was, it was a little challenging because, you know, I had some friends, you know, at my old school that I was like, uh, you know, it was kind of hard for me to kind of move on, you know, kind of start a new school. But once I started at Groves, you know, I was able to, you know, kind of make friends and you know, kind of just be who I am, you know, um, and just kind of, you know, be able to say, you know, say, hey, I, you know, have these learning disabilities, and, you know, kind of have one, you know, house has them too, so I'm not kind of feeling, you know, left out or singled out, you know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, thank you, and, you know, I actually, I want to ask that question of parents too, because you're a part, your family's a part of a transition into Groves as well, um, how about you start us out, Julie? Uh, do you want to share a little bit about what that was like for you as a parent? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a, you know, everyone gets to that point where they're realizing they wanted to make a school change. Um, and sometimes it can be a gradual decision as you're getting there. And sometimes it can be really abrupt of like, we've got to make a change. Um, so we were definitely in a place where we knew um, once we hit middle school, we needed that change. We needed something different. Um, making the change, it's, it's a little stressful because like as Silas said, you know, they're, they've established friendships, they have kind of direction they were at at a school or whatnot, and it's hard to want to disrupt that. And yet at the same time, we knew that um, we needed to change the trajectory of his learning experience, and that was really important. Um, 
so the transition was a little bumpy at first, mainly because, um, you know, we all come with a little apprehension. And so, but as they, as Silas met the teachers and the teachers just do such a great job at building a rapport with the kids and building um, kind of a trust relationship that's important so that they know they can, the teachers believe in them and they're gonna meet them where they're at and they're gonna work with them and they're not gonna force anything above or beyond what they can do in them. You know, they'll, they'll be very gentle in developing that relationship and developing their learning experience. And as he experienced that, which took some time, it really quickly um, brought down any walls or any apprehension because he saw how much he was in a um, safe environment and they were gonna really equip him. Thank you so much, Julie. Lisa, as a parent, I know you've done this um, three times or <laughs> with three different children and perhaps their experiences were all the same or a little bit different. What was that like as a family and for you as a parent moving into Groves? Um, well, we transitioned into Groves for our oldest daughter and then also for Sydney. I would say that was a fairly easy transition. They were having, they both had a lot of struggles at their previous school, um, not feeling very much support and being singled out by other students. So um, as Sydney mentioned, transitioning in was fairly easy. I think the support from the teachers, the individualization of how they were teaching, I think the communication and the advocacy that is there for them um, and the smaller class size made things um, easy for my two oldest. Um, my youngest had a little bit more of a struggle transitioning in because of um, moving away from some good friends at school. So that was definitely hard. Um, but I think my girls all really struggled with the homework piece at their previous school. Lots of frustration over homework, needing a lot of parent support and help with that. And moving into Groves, um, that piece just was a huge weight off our shoulders. Um, having the parents not need to be doing, um, helping with that homework and having the, your daughter advocate for themselves with the teacher, I need more help. And getting that help and support has been just wonderful. So they all transitioned very well, we were lucky. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing. Appreciate that. I have a question for Erica, um, coming from one of our families here. Do many of a GLOW's new students attend summer school prior to entering Groves? That's a great question. So we do have a fabulous, robust summer program, and we do have many students that will do our summer program and fall in love with us and then join us for full-time school. Um, and we also do have some families when they are planning to potentially be here next year for school or the year after do the summer program is almost like an extended orientation. It's a great way to get your feet wet, get comfortable, meet some of the staff, get comfortable with the building before you make that full transition. So the answer is we do have many students that will do that. However, you do not need to do the summer program to come to Groves. Um, it doesn't give any edge in the admissions process process um, and you would not be at any sort of um, deficit not doing the summer program coming in. So while we do have many people that do that, absolutely not a necessity. Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing that. We have another question from one of our um, guests today. We hear really positive things about GLOW and have heard from other families that their children spent um, two to three years at the school and transitioned back to their previous school is that happening today as well? I'm going to turn to a parent first and then I can address that question as well. Um, Lisa, do you wanna start us out with that? Sure. So Sydney's been at Girls for three years, as she mentioned. So she will be transitioning out to Benilde St. Margaret next year as a freshman in high school. Um, the process has gone as smooth as we could ever have hoped for. Kim has been um, fabulous in communication with us. Um, we started early in the year, so we made sure we attended um, some open houses at high schools, um, shadow days, things like that. But um, both the school and Kim have been really instrumental in making that transition um, smooth. It's been great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. And then I think you're, if I'm correct, I don't want to speak for her. Your oldest daughter is staying through graduation, though. That's the plan, correct? Yes, so our oldest okay. daughter, yes, will be staying. She's in 10th grade currently and will be staying at Groves through 12. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. So as the transitions advocate, that is my role, is um, to walk with you through that process. And as part of that process, it's a decision about, um, are they ready to go? Or is staying here through graduation really 
what is best for your child um, and what, what would that look like for them to stay and continue on and be a part of Groves um, all the way through graduation. As a graduating senior, um, Silas, talk a bit about how we help you and guide you in looking at post-secondary opportunities and your work with um, Ms. Jonas pops to my mind, but you might have more to add. Yeah, yeah. So what do we kind of, uh, Ms. Jonas and along with some of the other upper school um, teachers kind of help you is to help you kind of look at different colleges you might be interested in or if you were planning to do a gap year, um, kind of what you want to do in your gap year, um, first year kind of college, you know. Um, and so we kind of help you plan for, okay, this is kind of what, some things to expect at college or in your gap year or um, whatever you um, uh, kind of life life uh, gives you or so, mm -hmm. yeah. And how many students are in your graduating class, Silas? Do you I know? On our senior class, I think it's like 27 or 28 uh, seniors in our class. I think the biggest class, if I'm not wrong, I think. I believe you're right. Yeah, it's the largest yes. class we've had graduating. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another thing about transition that I just want to mention, I think our two students here and their families are very good examples of a Groves experience and that um, transitioning out after three years isn't everyone's path or trajectory. It can be very different. Um, and that's part of my role is to assist and guide through that process and, and decide, you know, what would this look like? And then looking at multiple schools, Sydney did not just look at BSM. Um, she did look at other schools and talking with her parents about the strengths of the other school, where the challenges my, might lie. Um, other decisions that go into transition are um, drive time, <laughs> and just to be frank about it, and um, location of the school, but also suitability. And are they gonna be able to support your child? Has your child, closed a gap to a point where they are self-advocating, are ready to try that next challenge, or is it going back into the school they had come from? So I hope that answered that question. Next question, is there an ideal age or grade to transitions into Groves? Uh, I'm gonna lean on admissions for that. Abby or Erica, who would like to take that question? I can speak to that. So what I would say is um, there isn't. Um, we accept students pretty much at every grade level with the exception if we don't take transfers past 11th grade. So we don't accept new seniors. Um, and the reason I say there isn't is every child's, every student's journey is different. And um, we come to that understanding or that, that um, decision to make a school change at different different points on that path. And so we are really able to help students transition in at any point. Um, with that being said, we do sometimes have a bubble where more students might transition in at more typical transition points. For example, when a student is, will be going to middle school anyways in their current district. So maybe looking at another path or going into high school. So we may have some periods of time where we have more students transitioning in at different grade levels. But overall, again, there is no perfect or ideal time we look at every child individually and determine when it's right to come to Groves. Thank you very much, Erica, for answering that. The next question is for our students. Uh, what is a typical day at Groves like? And I know there's a lot of curiosity around that because we are um, a smaller student-teacher ratio, but what's that typical day? I'm going to start with Sydney because, Sydney, you were in lower school as a sixth grader. So talk, if you can remember, talk about what a typical day is for a sixth grader. And then now you're an eighth grader in our middle school. What is that like? Um, in When I was in lower school, you were with a, like, the same group of people the whole day, pretty much. Unless for, like, spelling classes and math, you were moved around. But you were with that same, like, teacher most of the day which was good because then you built like a good relationship and you get an elective, which you go through like a rotation for. And we have lots of different electives and things. And then in middle school, you have six different class periods. One's an elective. You also get breaks. Like we have a recess or break throughout the day, which is always very nice. And we have in middle school, you get an advisory which is a group of, it can be sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. And it's just a group of people. And it's like a homeroom but with different grades. Thank you, Sydney, for sharing that. Silas, typical day as a senior, but any high school day would be good to share. Go yes. ahead. Um, so in the upper school, we have 
uh, kind of similar to those. We have six classes, and uh, we have uh, – it's kind of broken in between. Like, we have two breaks in there, too, as well. Um, and then we have our morning and uh, end-of-the-day advisory um, to kind of just check in with our advisory to see, you know, your homework, if we have, you know, stuff we need to get done on before school or after school or whatnot. And then um, we have, I think, electives, I think ninth and 10th grade. And then I think 11th and 12th, um, I think it's optional kind of too. I think there's some electives and then some um, other class you can take. Like I'm in a PBL class, which is our wood shop or project-based learning. Um, for the uh, juniors and seniors, um, and yeah. Thank you, Silas. You you both mentioned electives. Silas, um, could you share electives you have taken, and then if he misses any, Sydney, can you fill in the blanks between yeah. the two of you? I'm sure you've taken all of them, but let's see. Go ahead, Silas. Yeah. Um, some of the electives I've taken are um, music, home science, which is like home ec, um, and then um, theater. And then I'm forgetting something else, but uh, those are some of the electives that um, you need to take. For, oh, yeah, and then art class. Um, and yeah. That sounds like all of them. Okay, Sydney, yeah. did you miss any? Um, we also have gym and health. And along with theater, we there's media arts, which the students get to like pick topics and make like a news report kind of thing that the students at Groves get to watch them. Thank you for filling that in. I'm gonna talk, ask Curtis a question about extracurricular activities. And while he's answering, Sydney and Silas, if you could think of, um, and, and I know extra activities have been a little different the last couple of years, but things you've participated in as a student here that were outside of the classroom. Curtis, go ahead and talk about our after school activities, also known as ASA and sports. Oh, thank, thank you, Kim. And I just want to kind of add on to what Silas and Sydney were saying about the divisions in the typical day and the schedule. Um, just like the admissions process, everything's rigorous. We, we very much are very methodical in meeting students where they're at and through their profile and grouping them. So a lower school will look like a traditional lower school. However, if X kid is better in math, there might be a different math group and they might rotate. So there's flexibility there. And then as they continue on their journey through Groves, whether they enter in lower, middle or upper, as Silas mentioned, as he's a senior, he's taking a more independent project-based learning class that really suits to his strengths and maybe where he's going. So I just wanted to, to kind of add in that too. Um, as far as sports and activities, we value the academics, but we know that social opportunities help drive that as well. So we do have a after-school program, as Kim said, ASA, for mainly more for elementary age kids, but that might be various options such as arts, sports, you know, cooking, we have holiday baking, all these kinds of things based on what the kids are interested in that support maybe some of the classes they're taking in electives and helping them cultivate as we have some just brilliant artists here. We have brilliant creative minds. Um, and then for, as you get older into middle and high school, we do have sports. Um, we do have, we are in a conference for high school. We do have basketball and soccer. And for some other sports, such as like Nordic skiing or individualized ones that we wouldn't be able to support with our kind of our smaller population, we have a cooperative sponsorship. For example, Sydney here could be doing Nordic skiing at Benilde. Um, we've had a lot of students find success doing stuff like that. Uh, I'll leave it at that. If anybody wants to add on Silas or Sydney or please anyone else. Yeah, how about we'll start with Silas. Are there activities you participated in Silas that Mr. Olofsson did not mention? Um, yeah, so in the in the high school, and I think maybe uh, a little some of the eighth grades too. But like we have uh, the plays that we do put on um, that are kind of outside of school, um, and then we usually have three. We do one fall play and one spring play, and then uh, we're part of the one act play too that we do, which is a competition uh, play mm -hmm. in the winter. Mm -hmm. So it kind of goes on between you know November and um, January, and then we also I have, I've been a part of basketball team as like a concessions person and then uh, also help kind of manager, quote manager, you know, kind of helping out the team if they need anything. Um, yeah. Okay. And Sydney, are there acti activities you participated in that have not been mentioned? Um, I did track and field last year. And actually it was just a few students with our small population here. And we went to BSM. So we kind of combined with other schools and we just did some track. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. 
Okay, next question is oh, homework. I, to, I feel like we oh, should sure always um, just mention our state champion trap shooting team because that's something that I know a lot of our students are really proud of. So trap shooting is quickly becoming a very popular activity and sport in Minnesota. And we happen to be the state champions in our division. So I have to give that shout out. Erica, you do. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, we're super proud of our, our trap shooting team and that. Um, so thanks for remembering that. They would be pleased to know they got a big mention. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears. Um, we're gonna look at homework. Um, so what is homework like at Groves? Now I'm gonna ask the students, but parents, um, I want you to share your perspective on homework at Groves as well. Um, why don't we start with Silas and Julie, and then we'll go to Sydney and Lisa. So Silas and Julie. Yeah, so the homework uh, in the high school is um, like, it's usually, Sometimes it takes me like maybe an hour, depending on, you know, like say I spend like 15 minutes on a math assignment and 20 minutes reading and then another maybe like 10 minutes working on a project for, you know, my sociology uh, class or, you know, so it kind of, depending on how, like depending on the time, it could take you maybe like an hour at the most, maybe an hour and 15, 10 minutes, you know, at the most, maybe to like 45 minutes, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's homework just like any other school, but one of the things I think that um, they try to do is just balance um, the learning, uh, you know, uh, aspects that the, that the, or the challenges for each of the students too. So, um, you know, they don't want kids to get in the homework situation, you know, bogged down with, you know, two hours of math and it being tons of questions and things like that, that would never be the objective. And, um, and also they're very encouraging on how, if your child is spending too much time on one particular assignment or it's getting really exhausting, um, it could be a sign that um, maybe there needs to be an aspect where he needs to have re, you know things retaught or back up a little bit so that there's um, a better understanding. I, I think what I've always appreciated is that Homework was really an aspect of showing their their skills of mastery more than um, the skills that they're still trying to learn. So if it becomes too exhaustive, it would mean that then they're still in the learning component of it. And that's what teachers always are really encouraging parents to let them know when that's happening because they want to um, make sure that homework's kind of used more in that mastery aspect. Um, so meaning that the students already have it pretty well developed, the understanding of the concepts they're doing. So, um, and it's more on repetition and practice um, homework should be designed for. So I've always appreciated that. And the parents are, are the teachers are always very encouraging as well at having open communication with the parents, um, making sure you're communicating any aspects. If, if you have a night where it's just a bomb and, and nothing's working well and it's just whatever, well, hey, no worries. Let, let's email the teachers. Let's just say, hey, we need an extra time. There's a lot of flexibility um, that I have always experienced with the teachers. And also um, the other thing I was just gonna mention as Silas became a high schooler, one of the things the teachers did well is really um, wanting us to transition to having the student do more of their communication with the teacher, helping develop that skill set. And so even though if I maybe, you know, we're, we're seeing a struggle, then once he got to high school more, it shifted to more, um, I would encourage Silas to send that email so that, you know, and I maybe would help him in editing it or making sure he's getting across the key component that he needs. Um, and or I even have them CC in me so that the teachers are, are showing, we have a whole loop of communication happening, but they're also really wanting to develop the skills and the students as they are eight, you know, older and teenagers. Um, but that's just another aspect of the, the home communication component that goes on with homework and assignments. Um, I don't know if that's helpful. Very helpful. Okay. Thank you so much, Julie. And so let's switch a little bit over to um, homework as it looks in lower school, if you could speak to that, Lisa, and then um, Sydney talk about homework in the middle school and what that looks like. Let's start with Lisa. Yes, um, homework in the lower school is um, set up very much, it's very much organized for the student. 
So um, the teachers um, will set up calendars and help the student really plan out um, what do I need to do? How much do I need to read each day to be successful and complete assignments? Um, there's great teacher communication. Um, there's a planner that comes home every day that has their assignments written in that, um, that we can review together and make sure that things are getting done. But really the goal is not to overwhelm them. They typically have some fluency, um, a little bit of reading, um, but typically not um, some projects to do, but nothing that's overwhelming them. I would agree with everything Julie said, even with high school related to lower schools, the communication is great with the teachers. So if your child's ever being overwhelmed um, or not where they need to be to learn that piece that um, they're really understanding in, in that. So. Thank you so much, Lisa. And Sydney, homework as a middle school student. Um, in middle school, I typically get like a 30 minute reading log I have to do each night in something called action where you like read an article and then you have to answer comprehension questions. And you also get additional math and you get a planner and that's where your teachers, they check it over with you at the end of the day. So you know what you have to do for homework for that night and you know where you can find the information. And your teachers, like if something's not working, you can email your own teachers with your laptop that you get to bring home with you, you can email your teachers and just let them know that you're not getting to something and the teachers are really understanding of that. And I think it's really helpful that the teachers check over your planner with you and just make sure you know what you have to do for the night for homework and things like that. Thank you so much, Sydney. We have a question from one of our guests. Um, I'm gonna answer it. And if anybody wants to add on to that, feel free or let me know. We appreciate that GLOW fosters neurodiversity and helps each student thrive. Looking to a student's future outside of GLOW or Groves, how is an individual student progress tracked? And is this progress measured against standardized tests or education requirements? So a couple of things here. Um, one of the things that happens when your student is admitted to Groves is you go through a psychoeducational diagnostic assessment with one of our licensed psychologists. The normatives they use in there, they're diagnostic tools looking at cognitive abilities, as well as reading, writing, and math. And we really, really take a deep dive into that. We're not just saying where you at at math. We wanna know your math fluency, your ability to um, know math components. And then that is ranked um, when they come in against age-based norms for all children taking that particular protocol in the United States. So the ones that are typically used, but not always because each student's different, is the Wyatt 4. That is a standardized protocol that is used by our psychologist. We also, just new this year, administer the Wyatt 4 reading and phonological awareness and decoding and fluency testing at the end of September. Then we repeat it, the same protocols. Of course, they change a little bit because your child will have gotten older, but we do the same protocols then again at the end of April to look at progress. It's a tool that I utilize for transitions quite a bit to look for progress. Our teachers utilize it. All areas of our school utilize it to find out are, is the instruction that we're doing making that difference? So that psychoeducational assessment your child gets when they come in, that is repeated every three years for a clinical update. You are invited to come in and talk to the psychologist, not just after that first evaluation, but subsequent evaluations as well. So I hope that answered the question. What we do not use is MAP testing or NWEA. Those are not components that we use. We don't find them to be effective for our students. Uh, they are not something that we wanna put our students through. And that's actually why a lot of parents and families come to us is they don't like their students sitting and being taught to a test. We are here to nurture and develop your child as, the best, as best as we can. Our goal is to um, build their confidence so they can see success when they leave Groves, whether it's after graduation or moving on to a different school. So I hope that answered the question. If you have more questions about that, I would really lean in on our admissions team to talk through a little bit more about what that looks like because on their visit days, some of our students do additional testing with us, just really brief check-ins to get some grade level information on that. Next question, does anyone wanna to add to that? Okay. Um, students are going, they do what? <laughs> I didn't know, but you probably do know that you go through some testing here um, every three years when you're here. 
So the next question is about our executive functioning. And if you're not familiar with executive functioning, I think having our students describe what their EF classes are is a good base. And if you have additional questions about it, I can try and back that up when they're done talking about it. Now, Silas, I know for you, you are in a class for four years through our high school called executive functioning. Talk and share a little bit about what that class is and how it has evolved as you have grown in the upper school. Yeah, yeah. So the EF course, it started when I was in ninth grade, and it's gone all the way through my entire um, kind of high school course as a class. Um, where I'm at, and there's um, four different, um, why, as you transition, as, as, you, as you transition through the high school, there's four different um, categories we focus on in ninth grade. Or right now in senior, our senior year, focusing on legacy. And then, or, yeah, le legacy. And then in 11th grade, it's leadership. 10th grade, it's um, kind of getting to know your uh, your brain and kind of yourself uh, as a learner. And then um, I forget what it is in freshman year, but I know those are the um, three that we focus on in our EF classes. Um, kind of well, um, setting up ourselves for uh, kind of post-secondary uh, uh, post uh, options and then um, you know, college and gap years and kind of just kind of, kind of setting ourselves up for what's outside of Groves, uh, kind of so, yeah. Thank you, Silas, very much. Um, now, Sydney, uh, you do not explicitly have a class called executive functioning, but you do have executive functioning time. I believe it's on Fridays and then it's embedded into your classes. Um, describe as you, from your seat and where you sit as a student, what that looks like for you. Um, normally, our classes are shortened on Fridays, and sometimes we take one of those class periods or two, and we talk about EF, which for us is like time management and how we can plan out and make time for after school activities, but also get to our homework, because homework should come first and things. And it also teaches us about having an open mindset and like not thinking, like thinking outside of the box and just, yeah. Thank you. It's a class that I often hear parents say, I wish I could take that class. Um, it's a self-awareness as part of it. And the one part that Silas mentioned, he couldn't quite recall freshman year, it is, that's really what it's about. Who am I? Who am I as a learner? And what do I need to learn? Uh, we know that's so important, not just for our students, but for students everywhere. It's a course that we introduced to our school, I think about six years ago and have now migrated it through all the different divisions. It, it appears in different ways, but it is explicitly taught uh, in the middle school and the high school to students. And it is uh, indirectly introduced to our lower school students. We do different exercises with them in executive functioning. It makes us a little bit unique and it's something that as a transitions advocate, I get asked questions from other schools as I'm looking at them where did you get your instruction? How do you do this? Um, would your school be willing to share? So it's, um, it's pretty cool stuff. And it's, it's helping our students learn and navigate. And hopefully, and we know this too, they take this outside of our four walls. Anything to add, Erica? Yeah, I would just say a couple other things that I see um, directly taught in the executive functioning curriculum, especially in lower school and middle school, is a lot of like, um, strategies for note taking, um, and also emotional regulation, how to deal with stress, how to make goals, how to make sure you're following through with those goals. I mean, really, it's all of those skill sets that are needed to be successful in school that are not academic in nature. And really, all of those skills are things that will um, help our students beyond growth, either in their next place uh, for school or beyond in their career as well. So I think that's really a, a gem that we have at Groves is that direct time that we spend on those skills. Thank you. 
Abby, you had something you'd like to add. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I also wanted to add, you know, I think this ties in with our um, assistive technology and the work that we do with our um, with our students, just like we teach executive functioning to teach them how to be successful um, in and out of the classroom. We also um, have a really robust assistive technology programming and, and work with our students directly and indirectly on how to use um, adaptations um, and, and advocate for themselves and, and knowing how to 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 share what their disability is and why they need certain accommodations um, and what those might look like to, to share with um, an employer or um, a college or a high school. Um, and I just think that's a, that's a big piece and, and ties in with our executive functioning as well. Thank you, Abby, for um, adding that information about assistive technology. We have a good question. Um, who teaches EF, the teacher, psychologist, or both? Um, well, it's a little bit of both and a little bit of everyone uh, as a student moves through our high school. EF is taught in the high school by um, basically our language arts teachers. All have an EF class they teach at the 9, 10, and 11, 12 levels. In the middle school, we have two teachers assigned to creating a lesson planning and introducing it and rolling it out to all staff. And then it's administered or offered on Fridays during advisory time. In the lower school, there are two teachers that handle the curriculum development around executive function for age-based uh, first through fifth, sixth grade. And they do that, um, I do believe it's in their math block, but I might be wrong with that. And they do that one day a week. So, um, and know too that executive functioning, Abby mentioned the assistive technology, which crosses all curriculum areas, all levels of what we do. Um, executive functioning is embedded in our curriculum. It's one of our pillars. How do we teach our students to be learners and people in this planet and in this world? Um, so it, it kind of seeps into everywhere around us, but it's very explicitly taught in middle and upper school. Abby, go ahead. Yeah, or even thinking, um, you know, in, in middle school, um, in a meeting we were at, um, they were saying, you know what, we're going to have our kids check their emails every day. And so in advisory in the morning, they open up their computers and check their emails, which for an, an, a 12 year old, you know, that's not a typical thing to do. But those are the things that they're learning in school and, and through their advisory and indirect um, executive functioning training. Thank you so much, Abby. I would encourage you to the question about psychologist was in there. And I don't know if I directed that uh, appropriately. Um, our psychologists have been essential in the establishment of our executive functioning class uh, because so many students do have executive functioning, functioning challenges. They also offer seminars for parents and people in the community about executive functioning. So I would um, encourage you to keep an eye on our webpage to attend those. They're free, they're virtual, and you can get a lot more information from our psychologists about that. Have a couple questions about a typical day at Groves. One more time. Thing. Sorry, oh, sure thing, I would also Go just ahead. like to add, um, we have a really robust speech language department as well. And if a student needs some additional executive functioning um, support, um, all of our speech language pathologists are also certified ADHD and executive functioning coaches as well. And they will also weigh in and help our staff um, with creation of executive functioning lessons and making sure students that they are working with are um, seeing success in the classroom too. So there are so many experts and resources at Burroughs to tap into. Um, it's really fabulous as far as the depth of knowledge and how everyone works together to get the students what they need across the board. Thank you very much, Erica. Um, so some questions about just Groves and a school day. Uh, what time does school start? I'll look for a hand and call on you to answer that question. Oh, Curtis. Yes, go ahead, Curtis. <laughs> I can get this one right here. Let me think. Sorry, part of my job is creating a schedule. Wink, wink. I'm just being funny. Okay. Uh, 825 is our school day. 825 to 3 o'clock. All divisions start and end at the same time. They are coexisting as, a, as one big community of, 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 of I mean, they, they exist and they go, um, yeah, 3 o'clock before school care starts at 7.30. So if some kids are in for flexibility with families who may be on the other side of the metro, you can drop off. We have supervision in the morning. And then after school, like I mentioned before, we have some activities and options. You can Kids can be here up till like 5 p.m. Thank you, Curtis. Transportation. How do our kids get to school? Erica? 
Sure, I can tackle that. So um, most of our parents are providing their own transportation for their students. However, um, if you are interested, um, Amy Luffy, who is in our head office, she will help over the summer for new enrollees and existing parents to set up carpools. We do have a lot of families that carpool. It is wonderful um, that when it works out for families to carpool and we will help you connect with families in your area if you are interested and if it works out. Um, we also do have some students that will ride a bus to school, um, the Breck bus. So Breck school has busing that we can sometimes tap into. Um, it's contracted separately and it's a separate fee. Um, and what happens is there's routes around the metro where you're able to ride a bus from your home neighborhood to Breck School, and then there's a shuttle from Breck School that brings students over to Groves. So those are other um, transportation options, carpooling and Breck bus that we can explore, but most families are providing their own transportation. Of course, when students are older and they're driving themselves, we do have parking available and they can drive themselves to school as well. Thank you. And Abby. I just wanted to share that on Fridays, school ends at one o'clock. Teachers have dedicated work time and communication time. Um, however, we still do provide care until five o'clock that day. Thank you very much. So we do have one more question about a uh, wait list for middle school. So I, I think I'd like to turn it over to our admissions department to talk about our admissions process to um, discuss wait list if we get there and what that is looking like right now and take it away. Um, Erica? Yeah, I'll speak to wait list first, but if I have Abby talk about the process because she's the expert at helping families through. Um, currently, we still have availability next year at all levels. Um, we are rolling admissions. So the sooner you apply, the sooner we'll get you through the process, um, reviewed and get you through visit day of applicable and then an enrollment decision. Um, we will, of course, start to communicate with families if we start to get close to full where we think we might be looking at a wait list, but we are not there yet. So I encourage that if you are interested in GROWS, that you get in contact with admissions, you start the conversation with us, and we can absolutely guide you in the process. And with that being said, Abby, do you want to speak a little bit to what the admissions process looks like? Absolutely. Um, so the first step of the admissions process is to do a phone call with someone from our team. And so I will, since you all are here, um, I will be sending a follow-up email today or tomorrow um, and asking if you'd like to set up a phone call with one of us and, and we'll make that happen. And if anyone's not here as well, if you're watching this on a recording, I'm emailing you as well, um, or, or you're welcome to to find find us on online and send them um, uh, fill, fill out the contact us form and we'll we'll set up a call um, so we first do a call with with all potential applicants to learn about their student learn about their profile um, and see if we may be a good fit uh, if we do feel that we would be a good fit we will send you an application um, in the application you will submit the most recent diagnostic testing which we require to be within the past three years so that can be from a private institution as well as an IEP evaluation um, from the public school system. Um, we'll ask for any IEPs, 504s, or learning plans, as well as the most recent report card. And then we'll also ask for teacher feedback forms, which you will send um, a link directly to the, the student's teachers, uh, and that information will be sent directly to us. I'll be in close communication through the entire admissions process. Expect an email from me once a week if things aren't in, and I'm always available. Um, to answer questions and, and help through that. Uh, once an application is complete, we will do a full uh, document review. After we have read through everything and if we determine that it is a fit, we will move forward to a visit day. Um, I will give you a call and set up a visit day schedule um, for lower school and middle school, a full day visit for upper school, a half day visit, and we will plan a day for your student to come in um, and do that. And, and we'll go over all the details on the phone. Your student will come in for their visit day and we will um, see how see how it goes, see what they think of our school, see you know how, how they fit in and if, if we are gonna be able to, to support them in their learning journey. And then we'll be able to share with you a, a decision uh, shortly after that. Did I miss anything? Okay. I don't think so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abby and Erica. Well, with that, uh, I think we're going to wrap things up. I would like to thank our staff, Abby and Erica from admissions. Again, if you didn't get the message, reach out to them if you have questions, please. That's what we're here for. 
I'd like to thank Curtis for joining us as Director of School Operations and sharing a little bit about um, our school, the activities we offer for students. But most importantly, I would like to thank Julie and Silas and Lisa and Sydney for being here and sharing your experiences as parents and as students. We are immensely proud of both of you. Um, Silas, as you're preparing to graduate from Groves, and then Sydney, as you're ready to transition over to Benilde St. Margaret for your freshman year. Um, it has been a joy to watch your children grow. I can't say that enough. With that, we are complete. So take care, be well, and reach out to Groves if you have any questions. Thank you so much.